evening. Good evening. We welcome you to the Lord's house on a Monday, Thursday evening. The command, the mandate of our Savior is he gives us tonight the Lord's Supper, and so we're going to celebrate that this evening and also spend some time thinking about that again as we then strip our altar, putting, getting ready for our Good Friday celebration and, and uh, watching our Savior as he makes his way to the cross of Calvary. Always with the anticipation of Easter, three days away or so, and it'll all be done and be good to go again. So, we'll get Greg to turn on that TV back there when he gets a chance. Uh huh. -huh. And uh, I see the first slides ready out of order that I've got here. So, guess what? We'll begin with the invocation and then we'll sing our opening hymn, which is Hymn 629 What is This Bread? So, we begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We sing together. Knowing that the fullness of time had come, Jesus gathered his disciples to share the feast of Passover. However, in the breaking of the matzah bread and the blessing of the cup of thanksgiving, Jesus revealed the fulfillment of God's covenant in himself. In doing so, Jesus made a lasting testament of his promise to deliver us from our sin and the death we deserve. O oh Lord, we are grieved as we consider
while our hearts are grieved because of our sin and the suffering it brought on our Lord. It is here that we learn the depth of Jesus' love for us, and that he willingly endured all of this to save us from experiencing death and hell as we justly deserve. Why would he suffer so? Why would he expose himself to such scorn and hate? It is because of the incomprehensible and unsearchable depths of his love for us. So take heart and give thanks to God for the redemption that is ours in Christ our Lord. Our hearts are humbled, O Lord, to think that we gain forgiveness and life through your sufferings, death, and Upon this your confession, I by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in this stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Prepare us, Lord, for a seat at your table, so that we might humbly meditate on your passion. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And as they were reclining at table and eating, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. Prepare us, Lord, for a seat at your table, so that we might be strengthened in faith to hold the course despite all temptation. Jesus said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Prepare us, Lord, for a seat at your table, so that we might receive from you forgiveness of our sins. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in me. Whoever eats on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up on the last day. Prepare us, Lord, for a seat at your table, so that we might be restored in the hope of eternal life. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. Prepare us, O Lord, for a seat at your table, so we might faithfully participate in this sacred meal and recall the fulfillment of your promise to deliver your people from the slavery of sin and death. Grant that as we eat and drink together, we may know the true unity as we proclaim your death until you come again, and thus glorify you who lives and reigns with the Father and the Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. As we sing part of hymn number 634, The Death of Jesus Christ Our Lord.
Testament lesson appointed for this Monday, Thursday, the words of Jeremiah chapter 31, beginning at verse 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In the epistle lesson appointed for this evening, Hebrews chapter 10, beginning at verse 15. The Holy Spirit also bears witness to us, for after saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, and with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we'll invite you as you're able to rise as we hear the words of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 22nd chapter. Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat it. They said to him, Where will you have us prepare it? And he said to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters, and tell the master of the house. The teacher says to you, Where is the guest room, where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished. Prepare it there. And they went and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, he reclined at table, and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you that I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this, and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We join now in professing our Christian faith, using this, this evening the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand. May be seated as we sing our sermon hymn, 619, Thy Body Given for Me, O Savior.
mercy and peace are yours from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The text of our meditation is our gospel lesson, Luke chapter 22, beginning at verse 14. When the hour had come, he reclined at table, and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined. But woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. They began to question one another, which of them it could be who was going to do this. Those are the words of our text, dear Christian friend. During this whole Lenten season on our Wednesday nights, we've been looking at those words of Joseph. Joseph back there in Egypt, second in command, only below the Pharaoh. The Joseph whose brothers came to him when dad had died. No, before dad died, they came later. Back up. Before dad died, came to him with a problem. There was a famine, and they were about ready to see death and destruction. And so they come to him, being kind of afraid of what he might do if he recognizes who they are, and they lay all this out before him, and Joseph says to them the theme that we've been using all these weeks, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. He recalled for them how they meant all that, selling him into slavery, saying that he'd been killed by wild animals, all that time in the dungeon, all that time with Potiphar's wife making up lies about him, all of that he said very clearly, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. As we get near the end of Holy Week, near the end of all these events that lead up to the death of Christ, we can say that same thing tonight. As we look at the betrayal, as we look at tomorrow, as we look at him being hung on a cross, we can say that all those things that have taken place in these few hours between tonight and tomorrow, and he's on the cross dead, all those things were meant by a whole lot of people for evil. And yet God worked through all of those things for our good. Worked through all those things to bring about his eternal plan of salvation that he had devised even before the creation of the world. And so tonight, as we continue that walk with him to the cross and with that walk with him to the empty tomb, we catch up with him here at the Passover. He's earnestly desired, as we've sung, as we've read in our text, he's earnestly desired to eat this meal with his people, to eat this meal one last time with his disciples. And so he gathers together around with the table with them. He gathers around. He does the things that we oftentimes commemorate on Monday, Thursday evening. He has taught them. He has been with them. He's washed their feet. He's given them that example. He's given them that mandate. He's shown his love for them, knowing in his mind that he's soon to be betrayed, that he's soon to go to the cross of Calvary. He is there with them for one last time, to eat this meal one last time with them. And what do these bonehead disciples do? This most incredible evening, the Savior of the world sitting right there with them, preparing them for what's about to take place. And you know what they do. Same thing that oftentimes happens around our table at Christmas time or Easter when the family's all together dispute arises. A dispute arises about what? Here in the presence of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, here in the presence of the Creator of the universe through whose word everything was called into being, they're arguing about who's the greatest. Maybe it's me. Maybe it's you. No, it's not you. It's got to be me. And yet there's Jesus in his love for them, still leading them, still guiding them, still preparing to give them the, this most incredible gift of the Lord's Supper. And he comes to us tonight, and I'm going to say it's no different because we do the same bonehead thing. We jockey for position in the kingdom. We jockey for position here, there, or the other place. We have all these goods and all these gifts ready to be given to us. We say, eh, there's other stuff somewhere else that's even better than this. Maybe I'll go that way. And so I pray tonight that we can leave all that behind, that we can learn from those disciples how not to be as we're in the presence of our Savior. As we're in the presence of our Savior, and we come together tonight with a quiet somberness and with a quiet joyfulness, knowing that our Savior loves us so much that he would give his life for us, knowing that he loves us so much that he would give us this meal 
this meal that has its roots in the past, this meal which is so much a part of the present, and this meal which goes with us even into the future. Remember, that was his wish. I earnestly desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And so there he is. And that's how the sermon is going to be laid out this evening. There we have it. He's going to begin with the past, reminding them, recalling for them all the things that have taken place, why they celebrate this Passover year after year after year after year for centuries. Some 1,400 years they've been doing this, and he reminds them of all of that. He's going to share with them the present, what takes place in that upper room, as he tells them, this is the new covenant I'm giving to you, a covenant that far surpasses the old one, the covenant of my body and my blood. And then as he points them to the future, as he shares with them a gift that continues to give over and over and over and over again, all the way until Christ returns in glory to call all of us home to be with him in heaven. If we're quiet tonight on this Monday, Thursday, we can almost hear the past creeping up. And we probably were to close our eyes, we could see the images of that event that took place in Egypt, as we said, those 1,400 years or so earlier. We could recall all that had taken place. We could recall the plagues and the Pharaoh who would not let the people of God go. We can recall Moses and his plea over and over, let my people go, let my people go, and God sending those plagues to try to convince the Pharaoh until finally he says, okay, and they leave passing through the Red Sea on dry ground. We can almost hear that. Hear that as the angel of death passes over and as God's people leave to go headed to the new place. And yet as they go, they have a problem. Same old problem they've had since Adam and Eve. The problem is this little thing we call the vicious cycle of sin. And we know it well. We don't just have to read about it in the Word. We know it well. And that's how they live their lives out there in the wilderness. That's how they live their lives in the promised land, and that's how we live our lives even today. There's those days when we love and worship God. We serve him above all things. He's the most important thing in our life that there ever could be. Then there's also those days when we, like Peter, say to the little servant girl, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know this Jesus fellow. No, I'm not with him. No, I have nothing to do with him. You see, God calls on us to be in an exclusive relationship with him. He wants it just him and us, him and me, him and you, that exclusivity to just the two of us, while we so often, like our ancestors, want to play the field. See if there's maybe just a little something better out there, a little something better than what he has to give to us. And so I can imagine if I can put myself in my Savior's shoes, sitting there at that table with his disciples, about ready to give them the Lord's Supper, about ready to go out and be betrayed and hung on a cross, I wonder if maybe he didn't pray these words, the words of Psalm 13, verse 1. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? And what's the Lord say to him? He answers him, of course not. He answers him tonight, right now, this is all going to take place. And so we go from the past where where our Savior recounts all these things to the present. There in that upper room, they're celebrating the Lord's Supper with his disciples. And what does he do? He takes images, he takes things from the old meal. He takes a cup. They would have had a cup back there at the Passover because they had drank wine. They would have passed it around and all those things just like they're doing here. He takes it. He shows it to them. They've had two cups of it already with their meal. He shows it to them and he says, this is my blood. Take it and drink it. He takes the bread that they would have at that meal. He takes that bread, unleavened bread as you know, and he says to them, this is my body. Take it. Share it amongst yourself. Eat it. Do all of this, he says, in remembrance of me. There's going to be a new deliverance. Moses delivered the people through the Red Sea. Moses delivered the people to the promised land through the wilderness. He says there's going to be a new deliverance here. For through my body and through my blood given and shed for you on the cross of Calvary, you're going to be delivered from sin, from death, and from the power of the devil. You're going to be delivered from all those things that so trouble you. And you're going to be protected. Just as God protected his people in the wilderness, which these people remembered so well, your God protects you as well. And the best of all, you'll never have to drink from the cup of wrath. You'll never have to drink from that cup of which I'm going to drink for you. No, instead, you're going to get to feast on my body and blood, given and shed for you. I am going to be there. Just as Moses led his people through the wilderness, I'm going to lead you through the wilderness of life. 
I'm going to carry you, guide you, direct you all the way to the promised land, all the way to heaven. He says, that's what I'm going to do. That's the present, and he knows that. About ready to give his life for you and for me. He knows that in just a few hours, all that's going to take place. And in probably a little less than 24 hours, all of this will be done with. The Passover will be done with for another year. They can put that aside. They can put all the pieces up and wait for next year. His life will be over. It will all be done with. That's the present. That's the present that he gives to those people. Why? So that he can give you and me a future. That's his promise to us. The promise in two words, in those words I've read to you now twice, in the gospel lesson in our text for this evening. Two words, until and remembrance. Until, you heard it twice. He says, for I tell you, I will, I will not eat. Let me read that to you again. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. And then in, chapter 20, in verse 29, he says, I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. And the second word, remembrance. As he gave us his body and blood, he said, do this in remembrance of me. And we'll start there. Do this in remembrance of me. He comes and he does something for us that we cannot do for ourselves. He comes to give his life for you and for me. He comes to do that so that we can have life and salvation. So we can remember what took place. As we remember what took place, we see it all the way from the past to the present to the future. We see our Savior there in the room giving this meal to his disciples. We see him going out, being put on trial and dying on the cross of Calvary for us. We see him Easter morning alive. He's not here, the angels are going to tell us, because he has risen just as he said he would. And that comes all the way through to tonight, to St. Paul Lutheran Church in the Grove, Texas. And he comes to us again in his body and in his blood. And he says to us, this is the present. This is for you. This is the gift I give to you. For the assurance of your forgiveness, for the assurance of your salvation, for the strengthening of your faith. He says to us, do this in remembrance of me. You see, it's a gift that keeps on giving. It's not just a one and done thing like his death and his resurrection done only once. It's not like our baptism, baptized once into the body of Christ, into the family of God. No, it's over and over and over again. As he says, do this in remembrance of me. For how long? How long do we do this? How long do we receive this gift that just keeps on giving? The other word, until he comes again in glory. He says, this is his present to you and to me. And it's going over and over and over and over and over again. It's his gift to us until, until he sees fit to call us home. Until he sees fit to bring this whole world to an end. Until he sees fit to return in glory to say to us, come with me, good and faithful servants. Come and enjoy all the gifts that have been won for you by Jesus Christ. You see, we call that a foretaste of the feast to come. We know the feast is coming in the future. It's still waiting for us. We have a foretaste of it right now. We'll have a foretaste of it tonight. As Christ will put into our hands his body and say, take this and eat it for the forgiveness of your sin. So he'll give us a little sip of his blood, to that little glass of wine, and he'll say, take and drink this for the forgiveness of all of your sin. He says, this is the feast that I give to you over and over and over again until, until you join me at the feast of heaven around the banqueting table that will have no end. Until you join with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and mom and dad and grandpa and grandma and sons and daughters and aunts and uncles, all those who have gone before and all those, those who will come after us. He says to us, gather around. Gather around for the feast that I have to offer to you. Until, important word, until do this in remembrance of me. Until I call you home. Do this in remembrance of me. Until I call you home, rejoice in all these gifts that I give to you. Until your life is complete, know that I am there. Know that I am there in a very physical way, body and blood, given and shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sin. Do this in remembrance of me, and tonight we will. We'll do it remembering all that he's done for us, rejoicing in those gifts, those gifts won for us through his death and through his resurrection. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus.
Amen. We'll ask you this evening if you'd fill out a green worship attendance card for me as we do each Sunday morning. We'll receive our offerings at this time, and then we'll pray the prayers of the church after that. I invite you to rise and pray the prayer of the church and then prepare to celebrate the Lord's Supper. On this night when we remember how Jesus gave us his Holy Supper and allowed himself to be betrayed so we can be saved, let us pray for ourselves, for Christ's church, and for the world. Holy Lord, since your Son taught us that as often as we eat his bread, eat his bread and drink his cup, we proclaim his death until he comes. Use every such proclamation of Christ to turn those without faith to trust in the Passover lamb who offered himself for our salvation. Lord, in your mercy. Hear Holy Lord, we remorsefully confess that we are prone to stray. Guard and defend each of us from the temptations of the devil, the world, and our own sinful inclinations. Forgive our sins, strengthen our faith, and keep us as your own until you bring us to feast with angels, archangels, and all your saints at your heavenly table. Lord, in your mercy. Hear Holy Lord, we ask your blessing upon our nation, that in true repentance the people of this land may turn to you, acknowledge your goodness and mercy, and call upon you in true faith in Jesus Christ. Grant wisdom and guidance to all our elected leaders, prosper all good and noble vocations, and curb all evil enterprises. In all things, deliver your faithful people from all trial and temptation, and give them the strength to bear a faithful witness to you. Lord, in your mercy. Holy Lord, answer our prayers for those who are sick, suffering, dying, and grieving. Since your son suffered as we do, and since you know our needs far better than we do, give to each one of them and each of us your gracious care. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Holy Lord, Christ entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood. He has redeemed us and inaugurated your new covenant. Teach us to examine ourselves so that confessing our sins, 
we come in repentance to receive our Savior's body and blood. By those gifts that you place in our mouths at this altar, give us Christ's forgiveness and renew us in faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we place ourselves and all those for whom we pray, confident of the mercy that you show to us because of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. What is the sacrament of the altar? It is the true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, under the bread and wine, instituted by Christ himself for us Christians to eat and drink. O Lord Jesus, you have prepared for us a feast requiring nothing for us to do but believe in the words given and shed for you. By faith we receive the gifts you bestow, the gifts of forgiveness, life, and salvation. Grant, therefore, that we may never come to your table trusting in our own righteousness or relying on our own worthiness, but that we come trusting solely in what you have accomplished by your death and resurrection. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, ever one God, now and forever. Amen. Who receives this sacrament worthily? But the poor person is truly worthy and well prepared who has faith in these words given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. But anyone who does not believe these words or doubts them is unworthy and unprepared. For the words for you require all hearts to believe. O Lord Jesus, who examines and knows the hearts of all people, Grant us a true faith to hold fast to the promises of this blessed meal. By your spirit, help us to discern your body and blood. Confess together your death until you come again. Receive the salvation of our souls and be bound together as one in the work you have given us to do. As we come, we humble our hearts, recognizing that we gather, not because we have earned a place at your table, but because you invite us by your grace. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, ever one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke and gave to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Same way also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. Just do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. You may be seated as we receive the Lord's Supper.
What is the benefit of this eating and drinking? These words shall be said for you for the forgiveness of sins. Shows us that in the sacrament, forgiveness of sins, life and salvation are given us through these words. For where there is forgiveness of sins, there is also life and salvation. O 
Lord Jesus, this meal gives to us exactly what it promises, forgiveness and life. We are overwhelmed with this display of your love and mercy. Send us forth now with your blessing and grant that all we do be to your glory. To you we give all honor, praise, and thanks, for you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, ever one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You will all fall away, Jesus told them, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter declared, even if all fall away, I will not. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. We sing one verse of him, my time is drawing nigh. to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take the cup from me, yet not what I will but what you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Once more, he went away and prayed the same thing. We sing again. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say to him. Returning the third time, he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Just as he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, appeared. With him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Rabbi, and kissed him. We sing. of the altar, removing all the ornaments, linens, and pyramids, is an ancient custom of the church done on Monday Thursday. It is symbolic of the humiliation of Jesus at the hands of the soldiers. I will read some thoughts of what happened to Jesus at the various, as the various items are removed from the chancel area while you have the opportunity to reflect on what the events of Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter Sunday mean to you as a child of God. After the Last Supper, Less than 24 hours remained in the earthly life of our Lord. Events moved rapidly. Prayer in Gethsemane, betrayal by Judas, arrest, mock trial, painful beating, the trip to Golgotha, and death. As his life was stripped from him, so we strip our altar of the signs of life, 
to symbolize his redemptive suffering and death for us. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will have the light of life and will never walk in darkness. The events of Golgotha snuffed out the human life of Jesus, the light of the world. As even creation was dark when he suffered, so we extinguish our candles and remove them. Our monetary offerings represent one way of serving God and others. They reflect God's greatest offering to the world and to us in sending his son Jesus in human form. As the offered body of Jesus was removed from sight and burial, so we remove our offerings. The missile stand holds our worship books that guide our worship life together as we sing praises to God. As Jesus suffers, joyous songs are not heard. As these sounds of joy are removed from our lips, we remove the missile stand. Jesus' offered body and his shed blood have been given to us in, with, and under the form of bread and wine in the holy meal. As he was removed from us in the grave, so we remove the elements and vessels of this sacrament. Our altar is in the form of a table. It is here where our Lord Jesus serves us as both host and meal at his banquet feast. The coverings and pyramids are made of fine linen and brocade, material appropriate for feasting with our king. As our king's body was stripped in crucifixion, so our altar is stripped of its coverings.
the men seized Jesus and arrested him. Then one of those standing near drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Am I leading a rebellion, said Jesus, that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I was with you, teaching in the temple courts, and you did not arrest me. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. And everyone deserted him and fled. We sing one more time a verse of my time is drawing nigh. sung a hymn. They went out to the Mount of Olives. The Lord be with you. <laughs> 